Section 6 The Battle for the Birds, Part 2. Chapter 2. King of the Crows. It was Thursday. Terry's neighbors were still attempting to use his flap but the flap was now fighting back. The studio had a lower level of radiation overall and, as Terry moved about the rooms, he picked off sections of non-essential tape which he jammed under the skirting. This had a definite effect. What sort of decadent view has produced the monster below? Terry could only guess at their motivations and he had assured himself that the rhythms of nature were stronger than anything so far constructed and thrown at him. But Terry's selfish neighbors had no concern for others. His sinuses clicked and adjusted their way through their balancing act once more. He was used to it. Another morning of adjustments and additions was begun. He glued some paper into the far lounge ceiling corner. The Swiss shield was taped to the lounge wall, high up to the right of the serving hatch, in order to protect the immersion behind. Terry had a clearer idea of how the magnetic lines were traversing the flat. He tested the air in the lounge once more and, having surveyed the area, returned back to his safe space. He had slept in the same position on the floor for over a year now and he was fully aware of the likelihood of early morning barrages. He hoped that the silver stripe under the carpet would be making some serious attempt to de-energize the waves. He was wrong. Terry listened as the knocks began under the hallway. As the magpie celebrated the rooting out of a feast of insects in the garage gutters, the noise of the clicker from below resumed. Normal life surrounded Terry, but inside the flat, there was a struggle. The horse moved his ladders again and transported his parallel magnetic universe with him. Terry inspected his back in the mirror. He rubbed some cream into his shoulders before returning to the studio. By angling the meter he could follow the lines that flew like guy ropes from the far corner and up toward the small internal window. He had failed to address the problem there and Terry could now quite clearly follow other signals that traveled further up the flat from out of the studio door into the hallway light and the ceiling area toward the immersion wall. There were also the lines that ran up the hallway directly to the front door area where they disappeared diagonally into the walls. Yet other lines flew up from the floor directly beneath the lounge immersion side wall out toward the mast. Terry opened the immersion cupboard. The pipework was still confusing but Terry hoped that the green wave installed into the socket was holding back the intrusions and that its protection extended back along the kitchen ceiling to the boiler which was on the same circuit. Back to the studio, chair in hand, Terry once more identified the lines that ran into the small feature window above the door. Once he virtually covered the glass with tapes, paper, and the EMF shielding film, Terry concluded the maxim in his mind. If the radiation was high on the glass, then the tower must be reciprocating with huge voltages. That must be how it is accessing that far back in the flat. Another thought occurred to him that, maybe, the whole loft wire arrangement was being affected so massively, that much of the electric field was leaking down at certain positions where the wires were bunched. Once Terry could see that parts of the window were showing areas of a desirable 0.07T, that was enough. He answered this observation with the conclusion that the window was bleeding away the radioactive signals but he could not be sure whether the equations quite made sense. The surveyor had reassured Terry that, since the tower was not positioned within view of the downstairs flat, then the situation could be contained. However, Terry now knew better of the voltage and radiation levels that were being used. The further he fought off the angles, the more that they found new ways to creep in, trying to obtain best purchase. When the meter hit the lines once more, the levels of radiation were sometimes enormous. Any sensible health limits had been ditched by the authorities and all that mattered was that a connection was being made. No consideration was given to the way that the signal might arrive. Terry had seen that the mast itself had been drastically remodeled and now it was a two-tiered clump of antenna and boxes. He filled the bath and lay back with the meter in the usual position next to him on the left. Within a minute, and as if the horse were deliberately targeting him, the lines rose over the tin bath-like lasers at a pop concert. They flickered at their almost imperceptible rates. There was not a lot that Terry could do. After the bath he prepared to leave. As he put his boots on, a scrunch came from beneath the studio skirting. Downstairs a screwdriver fell loudly to the floor. Terry had already switched off the mains. He was off out to write a report for his own sanity. When he returned he found the horse and his family away. 
Terry used the moment. He retaped across the back wall of the studio and added further sheets to the corners. Wallpaper was stuck to the ceiling nearest the door and he covered it with a coat of shielding paint. The large aluminium bar was moved to under the furthest kitchen units, sitting as close to the wall as possible. Some of the copper tape was removed from inside the wardrobes and was refashioned into a marginal line under the studio window. The horse returned in a flurry of frustrated noises. The battle for the far wall was on. Terry measured the swirling voltages all through the studio floor area. In order to let his toes return to any semblance of normality, he spread another large square of radar deflective wallpaper under his chair. Later, he was diverted from his music to tie the large German fleece up on the curtain rail to cover the far lounge window which accordingly, made the studio signals fall. The next morning's bath was broken by the lasers that shot through his shoulders. His feet were beginning to look purple and bruised as the varicose veins surfaced but Terry was still unsure as to whether his body's symptoms were just repair systems going into overdrive. And why the shoulders? Maybe the laser-like connections through his body were finding the shallow skin on his shoulders too great an invitation. After a clean, Terry took the large aluminium bath mat from behind the immersion tank to a new position at the tap end of the bath, curved so as to gather together any signal that attempted to make its way through the gap under the bath itself. The studio felt more secure. The speed of the horse's voltage attempts instantaneously knocked the flat into different states. It was only when Terry spotted this that his confusions had an explanation. It was as if the various transmitters were linked in support of each other. The clicker was quite clearly changing things, the meter said so, but its purpose was unclear. What was certain was that by seemingly taking the voltage out of the walls, the signals were now struggling and this time, as they rose through to the 5VM and 9VM shells, its electromagnetic cooperator was lowered and unsteaded. Even as the wall voltages rose into the hundreds, Terry remained faithful that the equipment would struggle to gain a magnetic foothold. Terry saw the horse creep off down the garden, leaving the small Nazi girl as a lookout behind the tree. Downstairs, the scraping of a stepladder continued, as Mrs. Horse furthered her attempts. The next day, he was awake early again, and, by 5 o'clock a.m., he was watching the attempts, clearing his vision. The night had been intolerable. Whilst he had worked at the keyboard, he had felt every birthmark and freckle wince. Now he rubbed his sore skin as his lungs creeped back to life. After half an hour the signals retreated and Terry slept for a while. Without any announcement, the sound of voices broke the silence. The scaffolding was being removed and the steel pipes rang like bells across the estate. The new corner of the roof was finished in wooden lead. It was a good mend. Especially the lead. Terry pushed the aluminium bar on the kitchen floor further toward the pipe area. Then he identified something at the kitchen door that was aiming up into the light fitment. It seemed to enter into the room from the corner of the next door bathroom floor. With this still on his mind, Terry, seeing that the cupboards below the sink were already protected with aluminium sheets, now managed to lodge a rectangle of radiator preserver into the cupboard interior cutout hole to the left of the sink. Here he could see a line of immense strength that made its way through the wall and into the gas meter cupboard. Terry measured again. After following each line's pathway, he concluded that the sheet was functioning well. Next, he put an old adapter and shirt hangers down to the side of the old computer to the side of the toilet and finished this off with chicken wire. Terry lay in the bath, relaxed at last. There were a few needle-like shots at his head, but when he measured the trajectories, the focus of the beam seemed to have gone. He wondered if much of his mapping had given a false impression. Perhaps the fuse box area would always be flying out lines of voltage toward walls and this would need clarification. Terry then found what had produced the zing on the left side of his skull as he sat on the duvet on the studio floor. With the meter underneath his ankle reading a fluctuating 0.08 T, he moved the meter up into the space and watched as his body could allow or even encourage the lines to find the easiest routes out. He saw how the values rose as he put the meter to his shoulder. His left shoulder twinged again with that recognizably acute pointed pain. The meter stayed at 0.08 T. Then back to zero in an instant. As it increased once more, the hair on Terry's hand rose. It now ran up to 0.07 T waiting for the push. 
0.080, Terry's elbow clicked involuntarily and he felt a definite pull on his upper body to the right. 0.2060, t, back down to 0.17t. Then steady. Terry's heart fluctuated as his underarm muscle adjusted itself once more. A sharp pain pinned into his right shoulder. Confusingly, now he could not register any voltage and as Terry continued to take measurements, the radiation ran back up to 0.17t interspersed with failing flicks of 0.16t. It faltered down. He turned the meter to his left and found that many of the huge eruptions were spewing forth from the corner right behind where he slept. The tower's attempts were flying up that side of the flat and entering into the studio at that low height. This was in addition to the horse directing other devices toward the chase of the sockets in the room. Terry moved the meter down, still facing the corner. When he reached the dip of the pillow a larger signal was measured. Was this the same dip and hill effect that he had discovered on the lounge wall? He faced the doorway corner and the waves could be seen to enter sideways from the top of the hall side wall. There must be a clump of wires up there. The left side of Terry's skull felt another blow, but it was weaker this time. There was the familiar flick to 0.07t on the meter followed by the predictable banging from downstairs. He tried to link his thinking together to address the state of his problems and it seemed to make sense when the readings were low. When they flew up again, Terry would grade the various physiological outcomes which the magnetic and voltage differentials produced. At times, his focus was purely upon steadying his raised heart rate. When Terry returned from shopping, the meter read zero and there it stayed for five minutes. As he put the shopping away, he felt like he was living between two worlds, unable to judge which one would triumph. On Sunday, the studio window was opened narrowly. The protection on the radiator which included tapes, aluminium, the carpet gripper and a row of old plug adapters on the pipes was built to stop whatever was trying to make contact. Terry had taped the radiator with copper to the wall's grounding tape strap that ran under the window. He removed the carpet gripper just to observe the change and found that, by reopening a slight gap behind the radiator, the transmitter immediately found it and the signals rose. Terry measured them through and up to the upper corner of the window alcove where he glued some more wallpaper. Suddenly, there was a loud metallic bang from downstairs. Were they trying to mirror Terry's upstairs girders with their own large lumps of metal? A purpled crow rounded the channel corner and flew out majestically out to the country park at the base of the hill. By 11 o'clock a.m. his feet were telling him that the floor was more robustly grounded. The carpet gripper had already been replaced in its vertical position behind the radiator and Terry knew that the little stereo speakers were still lodged behind the metal, working some magic. He altered the aluminium sheet at the side of the studio radiator to form a curved funnel which he tested and the girder was moved to sit on the lounge window sill. Later, he was sat at the lounge computer, assessing the effectiveness of the large aluminium girder on the window sill, trying to place the source of a sharp knifing of voltage that had just sliced the back of his head. Terry thought that the skin in that area would bleed, and it was so vicious that the spot remained sore for a few minutes. Terry could almost feel the depth of its penetration as it had landed on the skull. He flashed the meter all about the flat. Voltage was everywhere. The 9VM level permeated almost every area. The safer rooms were the toilet and bedroom where parts of the room were safe, but his flat was shot. Terry put some hours in at the piano keyboard, using his suffering ears as a foil to direct his playing. He persevered through the volley of arrows as he looked out at the wide city vista. It was as rust-colored as an autumnal field of barley. A police helicopter flew directly over the flat as the sun set. Sudden dark shadows flashed across the blinds. The next day he spent out, returning with fresh hope and a new aluminium roll. There were always possibilities. Upon identifying the voltage line that was flying through the studio door gap from way beyond, he cut a decent length of radiator preserver and taped it with aluminium to the adjacent hallway wall so that it slightly covered the entrance. He papered over the small vertical gap on the wall to the right of the lounge door entirely and this had the effect of stopping the firing of an emitter in the hallway that was aimed up toward the lounge door area. The ceiling of the immersion cupboard was given a wallpapering and this helped the whole area. As he completed the task he noticed that the slightest gap between the wooden struts on the inside immersion wall would focus the microwave signals and that all of the flat's designs and kinks had to be taken care of. 
Terry slept as best he could. On the morning of the next Thursday, Terry had already further grounded the toilet side studio wall to the floor and he was waiting for this small victory to be reflected in the readings. As he worked on the problem, a nearby crow called out at every fall in the signal. Later, as Terry sat at the computer in the studio, he watched as two crows and a seagull rounded the flat's corner on a suitably timed air current. Terry broke away from the piano to put some wallpaper into the high corner of the window alcove where the blinds were screw fixed in. He sat down again and watched as the signals rose and fell before they arrived at zero once more. The achievement hit Terry like a slap and he sat there bemused. Why would they have behaved in this way? Was Terry's flat situated in the path of countless wireless communications? It was advantageous to these people. His home had unique views to distant hills. Maybe the forest to the north held hidden secrets of electromagnetic fields. His view to the southwest soared just above the city's vale and across the river. As he looked out from the studio, he knew that his future looked enormous and threatening. How could he see the full situation without appreciating that every flat could train its equipment on his building? Surely, by now, the horse and his compatriots would be gradually losing Terry on their electrically opportunistic map. Once made invisible, then Terry concluded that the tower would not make any further attempts. It was then that the lounge walls and window could be covered. Terry's right ear cleared itself by impulse. Were Terry's movements being predicted like a customer? Was he being held to ransom? Whatever was going on must be under some sort of surveillance. Somewhere else was judging the moves but not stopping it. Perhaps, the predictions had been made elsewhere as to how Terry would finish up. All factors would be considered, his age, outlook, influences and behavioral patterns before it was all summed up. Even if Terry had wanted to stay undercover, it was almost impossible. The next day a bunch of crows erupted into dispute from a distance. Terry heard them from the kitchen where he had already moved the top of the pine dresser, with its newly painted black back, into its place. The hallway wall near to the front door was partly painted black so the job was finished and the final part of the bedroom wall had now been papered to match the rest of the room. All that was left was the window wall and the buttress corner. Terry had placed some nickel-threaded material over the picture frame in the hallway before he started the evening at the keyboard. There was no reason to release new music if it wasn't ready and as September began, he continued to work in the lamplight and the music flowed without question or difficulty.